Well, good morning, everyone. It's good to see all of you here this morning for our Education Advocates meeting. Uh, we have several updates for you today, um, and uh, we're glad to welcome you and uh, give you some updates. A lot of these um, information items we share each month with you. We have some updates, so some of them will seem familiar. We'll just have some more information about them, and some are some new updates for just this month. So. Uh, we look forward to sharing that with you. I'm just looking here to see if our first um, topic, our ESSER update uh, with Wendy Fawns. I'm just looking to see if Wendy is on the call yet. I didn't see her. Um, I am here uh, in Wendy's place today. Sorry about that. <laughs> no worries. Thanks, Rebecca. Well, introducing Rebecca from our ESSER team. Go ahead. All right. Um, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. My name is Rebecca Brown. I am the ESSER program manager here at OPI, and I am here to uh, give just an ESSER update. I uh, am going to share my screen. Um, can you give me a thumbs up if you can see what's on my screen right now? Is that okay? Uh, able to be read? <laughs> yes, we can um, see Thank you. On this document, um, I have uh, just a couple high level um, views of ESSER update. Um, so right now, our monthly status is anchoring back on the month of April. Um, since we are in the month of May, we don't have a, a month end status update as of May. Um, and so out of our ESSER 3 allocation, um, we have spent down just under two thirds of that and we've got about 30% um, remaining. Um, in the use of funds of how these funds are being used, um, you can see that a, a majority of the ESSER funding has been used on instructional um, support for our students, specifically addressing the learning loss that we know happened during COVID. Um, and then a, another large portion of it is being spent on whole child wellness. This includes um, physical as well as mental wellness, um, health and safety, things like that. Um, and then there is a a proportion of it that is being used on other purposes outside of instructional or whole child wellness, um, but those purposes are are miscellaneous and quite varied, and so um, that's why we lump them into just this third category. Um, and then as far as the ESSER grants timeline, so ESSER started uh, clear back in 2020, and now we are in summer of 2024, um, so just looking ahead towards the future, the ESSER 3 obligation deadline for schools to have have, um, their budgets obligated is um, September of 2024. Um, the ESSER three will close out at the end of November. Um, and then just going into 20, uh, sorry, December 24 and 25, um, there will be a little bit of reporting on the back end after ESSER has been fully spent down. Um, so we are communicating those timelines to schools as well. Um, for ESSER reminders, um, these are reminders on things that are going out to schools frequently. We are having um, daily, weekly, monthly conversations with all of these school districts. Um, right now, uh, a big reminder is on that ESSER 3 closeout process. This is the last of the three ESSER grants, and so um, anything that uh, needed to be shored up throughout the entire ESSER process um, is coming to a close here as well, um, and we are just uh, working with those school districts to do exit interviews and make sure that they um, they feel comfortable in their closeout process and they have enough documentation. Um, there is also an opportunity for liquidation extension requests. Um, that opportunity has been posted on the ESSER website and communicated out through the ESSER Compass monthly. Um, and then we are also finishing up the annual data collection process. We have collected all that data from the school districts and we are working with the Department of Ed to um, submit and, and review and finalize that data. Um, and then finally, at the end of the ESSER closeout process, if a district has any um, unspent or unused funds that they do not um, anticipate being able to use by the closeout deadline, uh, we do have a process for them to return those ESSER funds. Um, and then as far as uh, projects that are being completed using ESSER funding, um, this is just kind of a high level snapshot of all of the uh, projects that we are seeing across the state. Um, 307 of our 402 school districts are using ESSER funding for these large projects. Um, and 
as you can see, there's 945 projects that we are currently aware of. And so several school districts are doing multiple um, projects. And a big one that we see a lot is the air quality. So that would be HVAC windows, um, asbestos, things like that. Um, and then another large one that we see a lot is the technology access, purchasing Chromebooks for students, upgrading servers, Wi-Fi, et cetera. Um, and then the last thing that I wanted to touch on today is uh, the extended or expanded learning opportunity, which we call the ELO. Um, this is the after school and or summer um, funding that is available through ESSER. And these after school or summer programming uh, need to focus on reading or math or both. Um, on our website, this uh, blue and white chart that you see over on the left, um, this is just an example of some of the many beneficial programs that we are seeing through this ELO uh, opportunity. And the map at the bottom right just shows uh, the counties where those ELO programs are currently located. Um, so that is just an overview of the ESSER update. If there are any questions, I am happy to answer those. Um, and I will, uh, I'll stop sharing my screen at this point, um, but thank you all. I appreciate your time. Chrissy, I have a quick, quick question. Rebecca, can you share what the additional reporting might look like? Um, you had mentioned that um, when the next closeout happens, there might be some additional reporting. Do you know what that looks like yet? Yes. Um, so the uh, annual federal data reporting um, is always on the previous fiscal year. So right now, the data collection that we're working on is reporting on uh, fiscal year 23, which ended last June. Currently, we are living in fiscal year 24. Um, and so we will be reporting on fiscal year 24 next spring. And then um, actually, the last three months of ESSER, uh, July, August, and September are in fiscal year 25. And so those will be reported on in spring of 26. Um, so it'll be the same data collection process that it has been. It's just um, that it, it it will be happening in the future. Thank you. Thanks, Rebecca. All right. Well, if there are no more questions, then we will move on to our next topic for the day, and that's the ESSA Growth Indicator Amendment. I believe Carrie Koba is on the call. I believe I saw her there. Yes, good morning. Thank you, Christy. So today we are just sharing our updates and where we're at in this whole process. And so some key points that we need to talk about is that with the original waiver that was granted, there were conditions in that. And as they're bulleted here is that we would launch a new assessment statewide in the 24-25 school year, so upcoming school year, set achievement standards on its new statewide assessment the summer of 25, we would report that information to parents and educators, and we would include that information on the state and local report card beginning in the fall of 25. We also were asked uh, as a condition to have an accountability system using data from the 24-25 school year that includes all required ESEA components and that it is the same for all public schools in the state. And then we also must submit an amendment to the ESEA Consolidated State Plan by June 1st, proposing a revised other academic indicator for elementary and middle schools. So then under this waiver, OPI will be permitted for one year to exclude schools participating in the field test in the 23-24 school year from identification of accountability, and in this case, additional targeted support and improvement. Next slide, please. So we have a pro proposed approach um, that we are going to use the and rely on the current Z-score model and that we standardize the scores within each year and then compare the standardized scores to evaluate growth and that we also propose to use a Z-score approach to calculate skip year growth for evaluating growth for 24-25 where the growth will be evaluated between 22-23 and then the 24-25. We also propose that the 24-25 accountability indicators will be reported but not used to make accountability de designations. And in this, in this instance, it would be targeted support and improvement or additional targeted support and improvement um, designations. Next slide, please. Here's a, oops. There you go. Here is a great visual of what's happened thus far, where we're going and where we 
um, would like to land. So this last year's or 22-23 Smarter Balance was taken by all. And in the 23-24 school year, I believe it's a, a third and two thirds. Um, two thirds took the mast and a third, it says half and half, but it's a little less than that. But we had a, this, a split between who took what. And then in the 24-25 school year, next year, all schools, grades three through eight, students will take the mast. Can you go to the next slide, please? Um, Carrie, go back to that slide really quick, please. This is Julie. Um, so it is half took mast. We had a third of our students take the um, form A of mast, which means they took it throughout the year. So you are correct in that a third did take that throughout the entire year. You, but we did have another portion of students um, who did uh, use what we called a form B, uh, which we used for um, purposes for the research and the data um, for comparison data to see how students were performing in the uh, form A compared to how they were performing at the end of the year in form B. And so we did have about half of the students when we added those together who did not participate in Smarter. Thanks. Perfect. Thank you so much. And so the next slide um, gives a visual of where the assessments landed and, and the accountability on what we're proposing. So you can see what I just said about 22-23. We just identified all of our schools, again, who um, that are, they're either Universal Comprehensive Support and Improvement, TSI, ATSI, or Rigorous Action. Um, and then as Julie had said, for 23-24, um, the assessment of who took the assessment and the accountability. I'm going to have Julie jump in here because I think I'm getting a little confused. Julie, can you jump in and talk about this slide, please? Sure. So um, I think, um, Carrie, you made a really good point, right? In 22-23, which was last school year, we had all of our students take Smarter Balance. Um, and then uh, it was a really good year for us uh, to um, kind of move into the next stage of this year with the pilot and the waiver of the double testing because we run the comprehensive system uh, every three years. So schools that are identified in the accountability system would have been based upon that 22-23, which is really important because that gives us all the way up until three more years until 26 when we'll run that accountability system again. So that means that this school year, um, no schools are gonna be identified whether they took the, the smarter balanced assessment Half of our schools still took that smarter balanced assessment and have summative scores. And so those schools um, uh, will have to uh, run the system to see if anyone is targeted or additional targeted um, for this year. So that would only be half of the group that took the smarter balance. So those numbers there, Carrie, um, are not correct because of what we just spoke about on the last slide. <laughs> and then our math schools, the half that did take this year, the mass did not take smarter due to that waiver. So we will not have data on them. And so when we get to 24, 25, the purpose of this amendment is because we don't have the ability to measure growth because growth is measured by two consecutive years. So because we have half of the data from 23 to 24, we can't measure that. And then when we go from 24 to 25, we still have half of the students that don't have data. So that's why we're proposing uh, to use a skip year data, which has actually been used previously in a lot of different other states in their accountability system during um, the pandemic. So we'll be looking at equating uh, growth from 23 when everybody took smarter to when everybody takes um, MAST in 25 and compare those scores. And then we are also proposing though, that in 25, when those scores come in, we'll report it out on the report cards because we have to, but we're also asking the department to hold schools harmless and not identify the targeted or the um, ATSI based upon data from 24, 25, that we will begin all of that again um, after we've had MAST in place for two full school years. Uh, using the data from 26, then we'll be able to have growth data from 25 to 26 and not have to do the skip here. So we're talking about a few different things about what's getting reported, 
um, the methodologies we have to use, and then the levels of accountability as we transition from the smarter to the mast. Thank you, Julie. Yep. And so the next slide shows the uh, timeline that we're working off of um, in terms of trying to get to that um, submission of June 1st. And so we're here today for Ed Advocates. Um, we do have a a site where you can actually give comments for public comment. We have a survey and I think Brian O'Leary put the, the link in your chat and it takes you to a page that has an FAQ. It has the language of the, in, the entire proposal and then also the link to the survey. So I encourage you to go there to give us input. We are seeking that. And then next week um, we will come back and there's a link there as well for that public comment webinar where we can address some of the suggestions and comments that are coming in from the field. Um, we will be meeting with the governor for consultation and then we will submit June 1st. So I just wanted to show what that page looks like. Um, Brian, if you could sh show the last page of the slide, slides please. This is what it looks like. So you know you're getting there. Um, everything that I just said is on this page. And that is it, and we open it up for questions. All right, well, thanks Carrie and Julie for um, sharing that information. And again, we encourage you to go to um, our this page uh, that Brian put in the chat and fill out the survey to give that public comment. Uh, we still have a couple more days to collect that and we really encourage all of our stakeholders to participate in that survey. So thanks so much. Okay, I think I'm up next with a legislation or a legislative implementation update. Um, I've been here before talking to you, I think about all of these implementation um, items, um, particularly in the last legislative session with a lot of these new um, legislative um, projects uh, handed to many of us here. And so we're excited to share um, our progress on implementation of these. And the first one I'll talk about are our public charter schools. Um, we're so excited to say 16 are already open. Two will be opening next school year. They're queued up and ready to go, but they'll actually be having students start next school year, not this upcoming school year. And so there are 16 that we have opened here internally. They're ready to open their doors for students this coming fall. And then we have just one that will be submitting their opening documents this week and we will get them uh, their school code and get them open and ready to welcome students um, in the fall as well. So that's moving along very smoothly. The education savings account is another new legislation here in Montana. And right now um, we have our application period is open. It opened May the 1st and it will be open to June the 1st. And we have about 25 um, applications for students um, from families um, in uh, the application pool right now. Um, what schools need to know is that uh, this will be a remittance back to the OPI because the ESA's um, accounts for students are funded on the base aid calculation. And so we will notify schools before those base aid payments come out as to any eligible students who are participating in um, the program, we will notify schools of that before the first base aid payment comes out and then schools will remit that amount back to the OPI. Um, and just remember there are two application periods um, for the ESA program. This is the first one from um, May the 1st to June the 1st. There's another one from November the 1st to December the 1st. So there will be potentially another notification period um, coming along later in the year. There is a parent steering committee that meets monthly. You can find recordings of those meetings um, online um, at our, our education savings account webpage. They're listed at the bottom of this slide. And the parent steering committee has helped craft the handbook, provide feedback on the ease of use of the application um, and on those eligible reimbursement categories and things like that. Um, next slide. So our early literacy, um, targeted intervention update. So this was House Bill 352. And right now students are being assessed. This is the time, the window of assessment for districts to determine eligibility for these early literacy targeted intervention programs. And whatever, um, which of the programs, there's the classroom base, there's the summer jumpstart programs, there's the home-based programs that districts decide to offer in um, within their schools. 
And right now they are doing those assessments and um, determining eligible students for these programs. So that is underway. And our OPI staff are preparing um, and supporting schools by providing ongoing PD and answering questions. Um, we did um, at the Board of Public Education uh, did approve the request uh, for a proposal for the home-based vendor. So that information will be coming out soon for schools uh, to understand how to um, get those licenses for that home-based program. So that will be coming along shortly as well. Um, next slide, I think the last one is the trustee repository. So this was House Bill 811 um, from last session and school elections have been happening. So <clears throat> this is where we need to remind everyone um, to please, especially the authorized representative, to please update those um, new trustee contact information in the trustee repository. The trustee repository itself is right on the front page of our website at opi.mt.gov. And we ask that clerks, we enter in that information for the um, school board trustees and their contact information as required by this law. Um, just that quick reminder. I know I keep, I've said it every time, especially these last couple of months with the school boards happening, um, elections happening around the state. So if there's any questions on any of these legislative updates, I'll be happy to answer them. All right. Okay. Well, the next topic, um, I will be introducing Crystal Smith uh, with our MAST update. Thank you, Assistant Superintendent. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and try to share my screen if you don't mind, and I'll run my run my own slides here. Um, you should be able to hopefully see my screen. Um, so I am here to give the MAST update. Um, I'd like to start today with providing you an update of where we are. Um, the fifth and final testing window for the second year of the MAST pilot um, closed on May 10th for both our Form A, which is our three-year participants, as well as our Form B um, participants who per, um, participated in MAST testlets in, in a more of an end-of-year um, research-based um, exercise for our pilot and um, the research and data gathering that we'll be continuing to do uh, moving forward into next year. Um, since May 10th, we have been busy with listening sessions for both our Form A and our Form B participants, um, holding our external um, feedback focus groups um, to, again, to hear the voice of those who are participating in uh, in MAST and, and get their feedback on what improvements they'd like to see, what went well, um, what were those challenges, and being able to um, work and, and activate what we're hearing in order to providing a uh, the best model that we can next year. Um, and then COG labs with students were also conducted. So COG labs are um, sitting in a um, research environment with students who have their first and only experience with a testlet. Um, and then they're prompted with some questions as far as how they're interacting with the testlets. What are their thoughts? What are their feelings? Um, so we can, again, um, gather the voice of our students who um, are using these testlets. We uh, continue to have high level data analysis review. So we have our admin level four review this week. Um, looking forward to, again, the high level data from window five here, um, probably the middle of June to look at all of the data that we've collected within um, the five testing windows. And then our team is also busy planning for summer and fall support um, as we roll out for the statewide assessment next year. And I will talk a little bit more about that in depth um, here in a few slides. So um, I wanted to share with you the participation data. This is only from window five. Um, so this, these are all the districts that have participated either in um, from the, the A group and the B group, um, about 85 districts. If you remember, we went to the um, Department of Education in the middle of December. We had to provide for them our policy around participation. Um, our goal, as it was with Smarter Balance in previous years and currently is for those districts that are taking Smarters, that our goal was 95% of students would complete um, the test lists that were assigned to them. So um, if you look at our participation for both math and ELA, um, Every district that participated was at least 90% or higher of participation for all of their students, which is remarkable for a pilot. Um, again, if you look back in um, the history of this pilot and the rollout, we know that um, 
The federal waiver that we received in August of 2023 really helped districts who wanted to be a part of the pilot to not have to double test and also take a smarter balanced assessment. So um, once that waiver came into play, our participation numbers increased significantly, um, and we are thrilled and very pleased with the um, level of participation that we had throughout the pilot this year, but especially in window five. Um, as I talked about some support, you'll see here the, the big buckets for support that we will have our team, um, as well as New Meridian on site for the OPI Summer Institute in Bozeman, um, giving some shaping the future of assessment um, and education presentations, as well as some very technical and logistical presentations about the implementation, the content alignment tool reporting, and then the Kite platform, which is what students use to access um, the testlets. So being able to provide the, the technical piece of that, as well as a visionary piece of, of MAST. Um, we have videos and recordings available now on our MAST website. Um, from the STC workshop that the assessment unit put on in April. I know they have another one coming um, for STCs in our state to help prepare and provide them with information they need moving into next year before the school year is out. Um, so it's coming up here shortly. And then um, on our website, you will see the details, all the details as they roll out, um, but then also the asynchronous learning opportunities. So um, we know that different folks learn in different ways. So we will provide open office hours, asynchronous trainings that can currently be accessed, um, and then um, larger group webinars as well, moving into the end of the summer months into August and September. Um, our team is currently in the works of planning another MAST summit, um, if you remember, the end of February was the first one that we held virtually. About 200 participants had registered. Uh, we're looking to hold that again in August, currently working with stakeholders to determine what would be the best date or dates to be able to um, offer that that align well with our school district um, leaders and teacher schedules. And then um, continuing to have STC workshops in the, the fall that are hosted by our admin or our, our assessment team. Um, we are also putting the final details on a mass roadshow, which is not on here. Um, if you remember in April, we visited nine uh, locations around the state, boots on the ground with New Meridian and OPI staff um, to talk about the mass assessment, um, look at detailed score reports and gather feedback. We plan on doing that again, as well as providing that um, in-person technical support with the curriculum alignment tool um, and the, the Kite platform to move forward. Um, I did want to address briefly some of the um, concerns that we have heard. Um, these, these concerns um, particularly came from um, the Board of Public Education panel that was held a couple of weeks ago at the last board meeting about concerns from stakeholders who either um, are currently piloting the district or, or piloting the assessment or had piloted um, in year one. And so we just wanted to address some of these um, and let you all know what we're doing to um, to find solution or resolution to them. So the first one we hear um, is that the um, using pilot data for federal and state accountability um, is something that districts don't want to see. So as Carrie and Julie had spoke about, um, we currently have an amendment request um, to our SS state consolidated plan that's due June 1st. We encourage um, everyone um, to provide uh, um, public comment on that as to what um, folks in the state would like to see happen with our federal accountability. We also tomorrow have an accreditation stakeholder session um, to determine and recommend what data or process will be used for state um, student achievement for the state accreditation moving into next year. Um, we hear that there's a lack of a growth measure. So um, a little to go into depth on there, ELA testlets reassess. Um, the same standards during the three windows next year. Um, so growth could be demonstrated in that ELA um, logistics of the testlets. Math testlets are used to assess students um, close to the time of learning. So math standards are not reassessed, but we are working with our, um, our vendor, New Meridian, to look at what a growth measure progression could look like to be available as soon as 2025-26. And then um, similar to Smarter Balance, longitudinal data from year to year is, is always available. Um, we hear that testlets are taking too long. So as I mentioned, we look at high-level data from every window. And the Admin 4 data shows that 60% of math and ELA testlets um, for 80% of our students took between 10 to 25 minutes to complete each testlet. So we are thrilled about 
um, that testing time. And we will be working with our vendor here later this week um, to really look into p-values and um, you know the validity of those test questions. But um, those are all looking well from the previous windows. Um, and then if you look at this, those 23 or 22 out of the 36 remaining math and ELA testlets that are not within that 65% did not exceed 30 minutes per testlet. Um, and through this iterative process, we continue to shorten the testlets. Um, we know some folks who spoke on the panel only had experience to last year um, in which testlets were not aligned to local scope and sequence and curriculum. Um, and so as that alignment has happened this year, we have seen a significant decrease in the testing time. Um, we've heard the concern about um, the rust, the rush expansion um, of moving to all grades into um, our statewide rollout. So um, visited with our assessment state assessment director to talk about like what was a smarter balance pilot and it was only piloted for one year. So currently we're in the second year of the mass pilot before we roll out to our statewide expansion. So we're um, we're happy with the data that we've gathered, the time that we've um, had to roll this out and to make those iterative changes is, and then the, the opportunity for districts to participate in either um, both years of the pilot, just one year of the pilot, or um, the form B model of the pilot in this most recent testing window. Um, we've heard the concern that um, the test is driving instruction. Um, during the Board of Public Ed panel, um, I believe McCall read the definition that the Board of Public Education recognizes that the primary purpose of assessment is to serve learning. We are very um, eager and excited that we believe that the mass assessment measures student learning um, with time for classroom teachers to intervene as needed that is truly driving instruction. So uh, we feel that this is actually a very um, positive component and aspect of um, the mass assessment, and which is really why the reason we went to a three-year model instead of a one-time summative approach. Uh, we've heard the comment and the concern about um, needing to rearrange classrooms for test room, testing security, a loss of instructional time. And we've continued to provide guidance that we are not asking teachers to cover walls, to um, adjust and adapt the student's natural learning environment to take these testlets. Um, so um, that is not what we're asking teachers to do by any means. We hear the concern of chronic absenteeism to um, resolve and help solution that with our districts. We have changed and moved the testing windows from three week um, testing windows to six weeks in duration uh, to accommodate and become more flexible. And then these testlets are being able to be made up in a classroom environment while other learning is going on for students. So um, if you look at the traditional um, summative approach where students have to be pulled out, you've got to find someone to proctor these assessments outside of the classroom. That is not the case for our, our, our mass testlets. And then finally, teachers are locked into pacing for the year. Uh, we truly don't view this as a problem. Um, instead, we're seeing that this is a commitment to providing um, all students with quality instruction at their grade level. Um, so we will continue to hear um, the voice of our stakeholders, the voice of those who are um, helping implement this, and we will continue to address um, these problems. But we did want to share some of the concerns on how our team is committed to um, gathering data to either support or find resolutions for, for these concerns. Um, and then finally, um, as I stated, when we met with the Board of Public Education, like our ultimate goal is to provide students and teachers um, with very actionable data that they have a positive experience with a state assessment that also meets an, um, our federal accountability and requirements for a federal assessment into, in order to receive federal funding um, in our state. So. Um, each testing window, we provide a survey feedback form that um, teachers, students, whoever has um, exposure and access to it are welcome to comment. And again, I just wanted to bring it back to um, what we're hearing from our teachers and what we're, we're hearing from our students. And you see a lot of the teachers who have commented on here um, really say that, that students are enjoying this, right? That um, that it's much shorter than Smarter Balance, that they feel that the student, the test questions written in a student-friendly format. Again, test questions are wrote, reviewed, um, and finalized by Montana educators, which we're excited about. Um, that they like to be able to align the testing with um, what they're being taught. It's a good checkpoint for teachers. So they're being able to use this data, even though we know right now is we're still assessing um, the test questions and making sure that they meet all of the rigorous demands to be on a statewide assessment, um, students or teachers still are seeing 
um, application to what they're teaching and what students are demonstrating as far as their learning. So um, with that, I am available for any questions that the group may have. Thank you so much, Crystal, uh, for sharing all of that information. Uh, our next agenda item um, is with Crystal Andrews. I see her here on the meeting and Crystal will be sharing our accreditation update with us. So go ahead, Crystal. Good morning, Christy. Hi, everyone. Um, I do not have a presentation, but a lot of good information for you. So I'm going to start with um, just our accreditation website. Make sure. You can see that okay. So I wanna review uh, the timeline for our finishing out our first year of our, the new accreditation process. Um, so as you can see, our timeline started uh, kind of towards the end when districts needed to submit in March, but I'm really gonna focus in what's going on currently. So um, this month, our uh, OPI program staff, 52 staff members uh, finished up their evaluations of our schools. Um, ISAP, so there were rubrics that they scored um, and they finished that up as of last Friday. Um, so my team now uh, is currently just doing a data check, to making sure everything is in and accurate um, and just you know compiling all of that data. Um, also, we have put out, and I will share after we look at the timeline here, what it looks like um, that districts are having the opportunity to go into their um, infinite campus data and ensure that it is accurate and what they would like to be submitted for um, the final score. Um, so that is being done through the Teach Montana system. Again, I will show you that after um, I go over the timeline here. So I'll come back to that one. And we also started our think tank up again. We have a great group. Um, we've already had two meetings. Um, I have to say the SEC this past meeting we, we really got a lot done already. We had um, a lot of great thinkers, a lot of great ideas. You know, we talked a lot about, um, you know, what went well for our first year, what, you know, could improve. And of course, we want to take all of that feedback. And, um, you know, in, in, uh, an example is, you know, some of the submissions for this first year, it was a lot of narrative or a lot of evidence pieces needing to be submitted. So how can we make some of the questions for this next year be maybe, you know, a drop down of answers or check, you know, a check boxes for certain things that would be appropriate and not so many just evidence pieces. So just making it a little bit more balanced in how um, and what we're expecting districts to submit. Um, so again, just an amazing conversation, kind of getting the ball rolling for this next year. We meet again tomorrow as our next think tank with that group. Um, we will, you know, work with the Board of Public Ed and what it will look like for um, this coming year. So we will go to them in the July meeting with our um, proposal for this next year. I, I'm trying to hesitate to say year two. I know I do say that, but if we're, you know, going into cycles or what it will look like, um, that will all be determined. Um, but it will be the second year of this new accreditation cycle. Um, and so we'll meet with the think tank throughout the summer. Uh, they have committed to working, you know, just to make sure we get that criteria and reference guide that provides those rubrics updated. Um, those were really helpful, not just for our scoring side and, you know, what we're looking for, but I know that was, uh, you know, I heard districts say that was what they went to, their go-to and how, you know, helping them through this process. So we wanna make sure that it's updated and accurate for this next year. And then, um, in September, the Board of Public, Public Ed will approve um, the process. We're hoping to have it pretty much set as to what it looks like so we can have that criteria and reference guide out to districts soon after that September board meeting, you know, very soon after. Um, we're hoping to give them, you know, most of the school year to work on this process again. Um, so from there, I want to jump over to uh, just to briefly show what it looks like in Teach Montana. Um, so district administrators, county superintendents, uh, district clerks will see this message here in blue. It's long because we wanted to make sure all the information could be here in one place, um, a really step-by-step -step as to what they should be doing and looking at this infinite campus data because this again is the first year where this, some of that data is moved over to that system. Um, so. I'm not gonna read it to you because this is really what they need to be doing, but basically they need to just go to the reports tab here on top, very easy to find. 
Um, they will select a report. There'll be 12 reports. There's nine in here right now for them to go into. They select a report. Again, this is all that was put into the Infinite Campus system. They'll pull it, pick their LE. So if it's a district that has an elementary and a high school, they'd have to do it for both. They'd pick the LE and run, generate the report. If they generate the report and there are errors or something is not accurate within Infinite Campus, it'll say that error um, it, and just it'll tell you exactly what it is. If there is no um, error, um, I can uh, I think I can remember where there was one where I did not see an error. If there's oh, not an error, it takes a second for it to generate, but if you hit it once, it will start to generate, hopefully. <laughs> and I'm not patient, so I'll hit it twice. I just did it while Christy was talking during her, there we go. See, I'm not patient enough. <laughs> um, if there are no errors, so that means the district has nothing to worry about for a section, this uh, sailboat pops up and says no results. No results means they're good to go for that section and they can move on to something else. So just clarifying a little bit of those things, um, I will say and go back to the dashboard, um, Nicole Fuat's team, the AIM team, is offering office hours this week. Um, you could look at their website, but also I have it posted here um, with the meeting, you know, the join, just to go through any questions. So if there is an error on a report and a district isn't sure maybe what that error means or how to code it differently, um, they are available this week and I'm sure into some of next week to um, get, get that figured out. Um, so they are busy working with districts, I know, as we're speaking now. So questions for that IC piece, happy to help direct you to the right people, but Nicole's team would be the contact for that. Um, so once we have all of this, we're, we're giving to Monday, June 3rd for the um, this data side of it. By then my team will be done um, looking at the data side on you know, what our team has scored. So those ISAP um, components, those um, on the rubrics, we will be uh, forming a report for the Board of Public Ed um, and have that for them at the July board meeting. So busy time trying to wrap up this first year um, and get uh, busy into the next year. So that is what I have for you today, but I am here and I know we have time, but end early if we can. <laughs> um, but I am here for questions if anyone has any. Thank you. It doesn't look like I see any questions. Um, thanks, Crystal. Uh, thanks everyone for sharing um, this wonderful information today. It was a full meeting um, with a lot of implementation updates. Um, and so as always, we're available. Please reach out to us with any questions. And thank you all for joining us today. Have a great rest of your day. Bye everyone.